So, okay. Now ice cream is off the list for pregnant women. Yogurt. Does it happen for yogurt or not really? Cause yogurt's cooked. Uh, yogurt is fermented uh, a bit. Okay. Um, you know, I, see, this is why I always hate, you know, giving my list of things that you shouldn't eat because it, it makes me sound like I'm afraid of everything, but you know, I had a, I had a yogurt E. coli outbreak a year and a half ago that sickened, you know, multiple children. It was also the yogurt. It had become the yogurt, the favorite yogurt of the Seattle Seahawks football team. However so, that happened. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but apparently that was how they marketed it. Um, you know, I think again, um, Keeping things fresh, keeping things simple. Um, you know, my neighbor made some ice cream for us, uh, brought it over to our house the other day. I mean, I didn't have much fear that there that would be highly contaminated with listeria because it was just made that day. Um, but, you know, you do trust people to clean the milkshake machine. You do trust people to clean machinery in a, you know, in a either a big facility or a little facility. Um, and, you know, that's where sometimes it's really hard to understand why people wouldn't take better care knowing how vulnerable a pregnant woman might be. Okay. So if you were pregnant, you're basically, you're saying, keep it simple, <laughs> keep it yeah. simple. <laughs> like over basically like make sure everything's fresh, cook everything. Um, yep. and you really have to avoid all things raw, anything that could be a listeria carrier, which is a lot right. of dairy, you know, unfortunately. Right. So it's a lot yeah. of dairy, but I mean, a lot of it too, is that, you know, um, it's, it's consumers can pay, you know, a lot of attention to like, if you're going to, you know, obviously stay away from deli meats and, and cheeses. That's one of the things that doctors tell you to when you're pregnant. But, you know, even if you're an elderly person, um, you know, if you, you got a cantaloupe and you wash it and you cut into it, you know, or it's or the same with fresh fruits and vegetables, if you cut it, use it right away. Don't stuff it in the back of your refrigerator and let it, you know, sit there for a week. Because again, if it has some listeria on it and it you let it grow at refrigerator temperatures, the bacteria will grow to a level that will overwhelm your body and your immune system to fight it. And that's what happens in these cases. You know, whether it's E. coli or salmonella or listeria, you know, the the ability for these bacteria to overwhelm our immune system has a lot to do with the infectious dose, how much of that pro how much of that bacteria you're getting into your body at one time, it may overwhelm your system. So that's why, you know, keeping fresh things fresh and, you know, using things quickly, don't let them sit in your, you know, on your countertop. Don't let them sit in your refrigerator for, you know, weeks and weeks, you know, is the way to avoid a lot of these things. If they're contaminated, uh, and they're in, in your home, that's how you can avoid these things. Uh, a lot of our politicians say, oh my gosh, America has the safest food system in the world. Is that true? Or is Europe, I mean, it seems like when you go to Europe, the foods are fresher, they have yeah. a lot less, you know, preservatives in them. So what is the truth? Do we, do we, or are now other countries, you know, going beyond us? Well, we don't have the safest food supply in the world. Uh, and you know, but other countries have their issues as well. Um, you know, I, I'm working on a a, a a listeriosis case in South Africa where a thousand people were sick and and 200 died, mostly children. Um, I'm working on another case in France where you know 50 children uh, suffered acute uh, kidney failure, two died from eating pizzas. You know, a frozen pizza, pizza that you buy in a grocery store. Yeah. And, okay. you know, what, what likely was contaminated was the flour. So when you pulled the frozen pizza out of, you know, the and stuck it in, you probably got some on your hands, got in your mouth and, you know, 
your kids are in the hospital. And so, um, yeah, so it does happen that, you know, these outbreaks happen. But, you know, there's also a lot of things that, like, in Denmark, they've been able to reduce, and I think that was in the movie, they've been able to reduce salmonella in their flocks significantly by if your flock tests positive for salmonella, that flock gets eradicated. I mean, most Americans don't realize that over the last couple of years, we've killed tens of millions of chickens because of bird flu. So something that we're not likely going to get, but it is a problem for birds, they'll kill the birds because of what might happen to the birds, but they won't kill the birds of what might happen to us. So there are some things that you can do. Um, one of the things I, I'm heading to uh, London Saturday for to speak uh, on a food safety conference. And one of the things that's interesting in London is they do what's called name and shame. Uh, the health authorities will actually go into a grocery store, take chicken out of it. They'll test it for salmonella and campylobacter. If it tests positive, they'll tell the public. And so then the grocery store is like, oh, I got to do more to fix this problem. So then they call up their you know, they're chicken producers and say, you need to fix this problem because I'm getting embarrassed. And so there are things you can do to kind of help the system correct itself for consumers not necessarily knowing, you know, what made them sick. Oh my God, that's a great idea. Wait, so we could yeah. do that here, right? We could oh, go absolutely. into our Ralph's and we could take the chicken, we could test it at home for salmonella, and then we could just shame Ralph's and the... Yep. and. Okay. Okay. Someone's going to do that idea. Um, oh, hey, I've done that. I've done that know? myself every once in a while. Um, <laughs> That'll get know, their that, attention. You're right. Yeah, That'll get their attention. Yeah. yeah. No, I I did it in Seattle. Oh, it's been several years ago where I, I you know, spent like, you know, 10 or 20,000 bucks testing chicken and, um, you know, and found out who it was. And then, you know, gave the information to the local TV station. And then they went and said, you know, oh, they're all oh, they're all mad at me for doing the testing, as opposed to being mad that they're, you know, the suppliers were sending them, you know, uh, chicken with chicken shit in it. So, are there any companies doing it right? Is there anybody you can give credit to that you're like, you know what, this company has contacted me or has contacted Food Safety and are really trying? Like, is anyone doing it well? So, um. Some of the grocery stores are actually doing a pretty good job of putting pressure on their supply chain. Costco, oh, uh, Walmart, okay, Costco, okay. Costco Walmart. Walmart, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, they have done a pretty remarkable job of putting the pressure on the supply chain to fix the problem. The one thing that I have found though is is that the with the pressure also needs to come a little bit more sharing of the profits because if you're asking your supply chain to step up and to do the right thing they actually need to be paid to do that and so one of the things that i've been encouraging you know especially the big box stores the big box you know uh restaurant chains is you know to share their profits with their supply chain so they can invest in food safety. Oh wow. And and really, I mean, gosh, I mean, you think of like Purdue, they need money. Like they or is there a middleman? Like what or or it just costs more than we think. I think, oh, Purdue's like it, it, Uber no, no, rich, no, no, no. But, but it's you know, it's stockholder pressure, you know, a cent a pound for when you're producing, you know millions and millions of chickens a day, a cent a pound adds up. And that cent a pound might have an adverse impact on their stock price. It's, they just need to look at the big picture. And again, we all kind of have this, you know, anti-regulation kind of thing going on with us. But yeah. it's that's where regulation really kind of comes into play. You know, it has to be smart. It has to be scientifically based. And it has to take into account to the size of the company as you're regulating, because you don't want to regulate all the small players out. So then you have to deal with all, only big players, but you want to make regulation to kind of help even the playing field. So people have to live up to, 
you know, what they're supposed to do. That's the beauty of what the USDA did in 1994 when they said, thou shalt not have E. coli in hamburger anymore. Everybody had to play by that rule. And guess what? They put me out of the meat business. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize this. I, I told you this before we started recording. I'm so mad that I just found you through this documentary because I was a part of the fig and olive sickening. Of, was it salmonella in 2015? It was, it was salmonella. Yeah, it was salmonella. In, oh. It was DC, DC, New York, and LA, almost all the same time. I'm so depressed, Bill, because that lawsuit could have bought me my Hermes bag. <laughs> it's okay. Well, it, it probably would have done more than that. But you know, the the, there were some really, really, really sick people. And, um, you know, many now, people were hospitalized. It was, there were some really, yeah, there were some really sick folks in that outbreak. Okay. Well, that was my question to you for people listening, because millions of Americans are sickened every year by E. coli, salmonella, listeria. Okay. So when I was that sick, when from the fig and olive, it was from their truffle oil and truffle their oil. mushroom. Mm -hmm croquettes yep. that my husband and I had yep. had. It was the first time ever in my life I said, oh my God, I know how people die from um, food yeah. poisoning ever. I Because I'd never experienced anything like that. I mean, like you almost couldn't leave the bathroom. It was like right. really wild. I was just like, oh yeah. my God, is this going to... And you know what? I, I never got quite to the point like I thought I needed to go to the hospital, but... And, I, and so therefore I never did. And I thought, well, I wasn't hospitalized. I can't sue right? I can't be a part of this lawsuit. Right. Um, but is that always true? Like if somebody's listening and God forbid, I don't know, their child gets listeria, but doesn't need to be hospitalized. I mean, is there still legal recourse and should yeah, people pursue I mean, it? Right. So, um, you know, because you were not tested for salmonella, you, you, that if you were just in and of yourself, just one person and you gotten sick, it, yeah, it wouldn't be worth trying to go forward. But when you're part of a recognized outbreak that literally hundreds of people got sick, you know, the, you know, it, uh, we know what caused your illness. You ate there, you ate the same product, you, you had onset of symptoms. Here's an interesting little kind of an odd fact for every one person counted in a salmonella outbreak, the CDC estimates that there's 38.5 other people who got sick, but didn't seek medical treatment, didn't get stool cultures. So you were part of that 38.5 other people who weren't part of the outbreak. Would you think about it, that that likely that uh, outbreak link to Fig and Olive was of the 200 and some odd people who got sick, there were 38 times that number that actually got sick. So we're talking thousands and thousands of people that got sick. Oh my God. Okay. I can't go back. I like, this is so depressing. <laughs> I would have gotten so much money, but anyway, um, you, you know, your work is fantastic. I, I just, like I said, I saw this documentary. I was like, oh my God, I have to have Bill on to talk to my, to my viewers. And so many of them have kids and you put out an awesome blog. Um, and it's uh marlerblog.com, right? You, and you, you blog almost daily. I do. I do. It's a, uh, my wife, yeah, my wife catches me doing it at odd times. So she goes, how do you ever have, do you ever have not something to say? And I'm like, you know, it's like, yeah. I mean, there's, I, I, hey, I'm really passionate about what I do. And I, I'm i I'm really lucky to have a, a job that I really enjoy. And, and a lot, I love helping these folks. And I love trying to fix problems. And um, so, you know, I kind of do what I can. You know, sometimes I feel... Sometimes I have to, and I know they caught me on film, you know, being a little depressed. Um, yes, you and, were. And was, I was, yeah, and I was, yeah, 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 yeah. It sometimes I feel like, you know, I don't work hard enough or fast enough, and you know that kind of bothers me. So I then I just keep working. So, but um, yeah, no, I I'm really lucky. Most lawyers hate their jobs. Most people hate lawyers. I, I just happen to have a lawyer job that I really love. And, you know, yet if somebody doesn't like me for representing little poison children, hell with them. So. Oh, yeah. Screw them. Um, I yeah. love the blogs. I mean, you you were one recently is what's with Trader Joe's and recalls. And you go through all the recalls of their stuff, like from this summer. I mean, like they had like metal and shit. Like, I mean, that's like so crazy how they can metal, do that. rocks. 
you know, they had milk allergens that could, you know, be deadly to some people. So, yeah, you know, I mean, again, so much of what we do in this space isn't rocket science. It's just paying enough attention. This is a little cliche, but there's uh, uh, Frank Giannis, who's uh, in the movie as the guy from the FDA. He didn't get quite as butchered as the lady from the uh, USDA. But, you know, Frank has worked on this concept called a food safety culture. And it really is like it creating a culture where people are paying attention to details. And uh, I'll maybe leave you with this yeah, example, kind this. Of yeah. circling back to Jack in the Box. You know, the Jack in the Box outbreak, as I kind of pointed out in the movie, was caused because they knowingly ignored food safety regulations. They they said, you know, you know, we don't need to pay attention to Washington State, which has higher cook temps than the other 49 states. Instead of saying that, why didn't they go now? Why is Washington's cook temps higher? You know, what what maybe we need to pay attention to that. And that's where I talk about food safety culture. There's never been an outbreak that I've been involved in where there wasn't some warning sign before disaster strikes. Mm -hmm. And it really is, do you have the people who work for you? Do you have a culture of being able to speak up and say, hey, we got to do this because X, Y, and Z and have a CEO or a CFO or a chairman of the board, the board of directors paying attention because you don't want me showing up on your doorstep. You just don't. And it's not good for the company. It's certainly not good for my client. Um, and the person, frankly, it's only good for is me because I'm going to get paid. Right, right. I know. And wouldn't it be nice if you were out of business because food was that safe? I know. Maybe I could maybe I could start a competing podcast. <laughs> You'd be great. You'd be great. You're very entertaining. You're very entertaining. Bill Marler, thank you for your time. So oh, amazing. Thank you. Uh, the doc is still out. Poisoned the dirty yep. truth about our food. So good. Bye, Bill. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bill. you. Have a great day. Good luck you with the too. kids. Thank Bye -bye. you.